We begin this time. Mighty and merciful God, we pray that your blessings and your love and your joy and your teaching will wash over us now. From head to toe, O God, will be covered by your word. And we indeed will be also covered by your convictions and been covered also by your transformations. May the word that we have just heard, O God, begin to take root in our hearts and we pray the spirits will begin to till the soil of our hearts. Let them grow, let them take root, let them sprout, let them also bear fruits in the time to come. That these words will not just be mere black letters on white pages, but they will be words of convictions, words of power, words of truth that we hold and we live as your disciples. Be with us now. May the word of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our Lord, our Redeemer, our Rock of Salvation. And this we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you just picture this? A person in fine clothes and all the bling bling that he or she carry walks in and receives an immediate courtesies and hospitality. Oh, come, please sit here at the, at the head of the table, at the best seats of the, table, of the house. And then a person walk in in ragged clothes, maybe doesn't even smell that pleasant, is rendered to sit in the corner, or even on the ground, like an animal. Just sit at someone's feet. It's to render that person to the lowest stations of life in the Greco-Roman world. And it's also render a person as if the person is not a human being, a slave, so to speak. Sit at my feet, because you're not worth my attention to be eye level, so to speak. I'd like to begin this story by telling you a story about this woman I know named Doris. Doris' husband was one of the most successful, respected orthopedic surgeons in the city. He received numerous accolades for his pioneer innovative surgical techniques. As a housewife, Doris kept their beautiful home on the bluff over the view of the oceans. One day when she came to the social hall with other ladies in the church, and those in the ladies, you know, fine clothes and shoes as they often come to church with, she noticed that there was a person came in from the side door who was, was dressed in ragged clothes. And in fact, her shoes that she was wearing is not really the shoes. It was kind of like duct tape together with different things and soles and this and that. No one was really talking to her. So without hesitation, Doris walked over to say hello. Mind you, this person, even though of tremendous wealth, and prestige and, act, and, and recognition by the, the society they're part of. She never really dressed up like others. She wears a simple white dress to church, and she wears a simple flat sole shoes to church every single Sunday. That wasn't her purpose, to come to church with all the nice things. She walked over there, but, but before she did that, she knows that initially in the eyes of the ladies, there was a there was a sense of disgust. Oh, why is that person doing here? But and then immediately, some of the ladies will catch themselves and realize, whoa, this is a person of great poverty and destitution, so we should show some compassion. So they saw compassion in their eyes, some of the ladies' eyes, but there was no actions to follow. So she walked over, said hello, sat down with her, shared a cup of coffee, got to know her better, and in their conversation, she found out that this woman was abused by her husband for many years. And when she finally left him, she had no job skills and no education, so she was rendered homeless on the street. At the mercies of one or two shelters just for women in that city, because most shelters are mixed genders. But you don't get there in time, where if the quarters fill for that month or that week, then you're on your own. You're out of luck. You need to fend for yourself as a homeless person in the dark nights and cold nights in the street and also as a woman. Homelessness for children and women are the most vulnerable of all people in the homeless uh, populations. Men can defend themselves in many ways, but for children and women on the streets, 
They really can't. So finally, Doris asks, is there anything that she can do other than giving her that person money? Because knowing that giving them money is not the best of things, but it might be the easiest thing, and maybe pacify their own sense of guilt. She's, and the woman looked at her shoes and said, I could use a pair of shoes. Without hesitation, Doris took off her shoes and handed it to her, and the woman threw her shoes, her shoes, really not shoes, it's just soles and duct tape and things, tossed in the, in, the, in the garbage can and walked out in a nice pair of simple flat sole shoes. The woman at the corner marveled at this actions and feeling embarrassed, feeling guilty, they began to talk and form a new ministry. They would go to this woman's shelter once a week and wash the feet of these women. Clean their souls. Make sure the skins are all clean off. Dead skins are clean off. And if they can, give them a pedicure. A luxury where many of us may take it for granted because we can just go to the salon and have it done. I don't know about you, but I got my done. Just kidding. Really, just kidding. I don't do pedicure. More manicure. You can ask Julie. And then from then on, every week they would show up to just wash the woman's feet and begin the ministry of providing shoes because they walk on the streets all day long. Chapter 1 of James, as we begin this series of Book of James. I know last Sunday we uh, hosted uh, one of the one of your own that grew up in the church, the KPCMD, and became a minister. And he came and spoke to a neutral pulpit. And we didn't get to talk about James 1, but I sent uh, the introduction of James 1 in the vine during August. Chapter 1, last verse. If you have your Bible open, I'd like to invite you to open your Bible. To chapter 1, the very last verse, it says this. James is a book about imperative. 109 verses, there are over 58 direct commands. James doesn't fool around. James is someone who doesn't beat around the bush. He is going to get to the point right away and tell you what you as a believer should do. Not explain it to you, but just going to say it to you. Because he is basing on the foundations of Christ in the gospel that's already evident and already known by the believers. Now you need to do what has been done. James is also written around the, the second or third generation of believers. That means the first generation believer who witnessed the resurrection of Christ had likely died off. So the second and third generation now are living the faith that's been passed to them by stories, by the Gospels, by memories of others. So all the more action needs to begin to count. It's not just, oh, I saw Jesus rise from the grave. I touched his wounds or I witnessed him speaking to us after he died. It's more like, I heard these stories, I see the impact of these people's lives, and I see how it impact my life, and I'm going to live differently now. So James comes to them to talk about this, and the passage we will have studied together, and I'd like to invite you to read over that. It talk about, in chapter 1, talk about the gift from God. Every perfect gift comes from the Father of delight. Father of light. We all know this verse. We, in fact, many of us grew up singing that song, that praise song. And then the last verse, verse 27, it says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this. To care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Let me read that again. Religion that is pure, that is clear, that is unquestioned, that is not boggled down, not adulterated, not changed, not somehow inundated by different things and justifications, just as it is. Religion that is straight up before God, our Father, is to care for the orphan and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And James goes right in to the very point that he's trying to make. And he talks about partiality, making judgments, making assessment based on external covering, based on superficial titles, based on external representation that we put on ourselves. The reality here is that the church is facing challenges to grow because a persecution is happening 
to the Christians. They are a band of common worker, merchant class, beginning to mer- merge together in a household by the generosity of certain household members that they can meet there, begin to worship God. The question they are asking one another is, how can we deepen our faith? James, come to them, brother of Jesus, come to them with a straight-up theology. Not even theology, straight-up practical, practicality of faith. This is what you do. So keep the Bible open on chapter 2. The reality is that this, their situation is dire. They need to grow. They need to expand. They need to begin to attract new believers. And also, they not, need not be persecuted any more than they are already. So James comes to them talking about this. And so this entire series on the book of James for the sept- month of September, I'd really like to, us to focus on practicality, things that we can tangibly practice and focus on. This is also the third year of my time with you. So you remember two years ago I came, we talked about this, and this is the sermon series I preached two years ago it was about elements of faith, that, elements that cause our faith to grow. We talk about when the Bible come alive in your life, that you know God is real. When you pray for something that's truly urgent and is in accordance to God's will, and it happens, faith becomes real. When you are in need, and no one else knows this, but somehow somewhere reach out and touch your lives, you know God is real because your life has changed. So this is the third year I'm with you. And we want, I really want us to focus on how to be practical in living our community, in living our faith. So the entire month, month of September, we'll be talking about the book of James. And what better than that book because it's so practical. In the sermon notes, I, t- I call this first section is the first rules of mercy. Mercy triumphs judgment. Why? This is what we're going to talk about this. First rule of mercy is hospitality to all. Hospitality to all. We don't distinguish who has this, who has not. Therefore, receive this, receive, not receive that. We know that. But in our human being and our human nature at times, we do distinguish. Whoa, the person drives a nicer car, have a nicer home, will do this better, will have a better grade, will look this way, talk this way. And we even we evaluate based on the external factors. Can they do this because they have this? Can they do that because they have that? If we do that, we only, exp- we only experiment and also assess on superficiality. James comes to them and says the most human example is that the fundamental part is that we human beings bear evil thoughts. Evil thoughts. This is like, whoa, I am capable of evil thoughts. You are capable of evil thoughts when we judge others. The word partiality, the word to make distinction in Greek literally means to turn about face. That means you turn your face away from the other person. 100 and, 180 degree. Right? Okay. I'm just checking to make sure I got my degree correctly. Literally means that you do not see that thing eye to eye. The same thing you see. You make that distinction apart from the other person completely separately. James is also being satirical when he said to them, when you distinguish those who dress better, who had better jewelry, the gold they wear, and the, the station of light they hold, you also forget they're the one who's going to drag you to court. They're the one who's going to take you to the Colosseum. No, no, no. You don't get to be invited to the box seat. You get to be the main event next to the gladiator or the lions. You see, James is telling them that the people who dress to come in that way likely could be the official of the city, of the town, who f- will find reason to persecute you because you are a Christian. What did James write? He said they, the people who do that were blasphemy the excellent name that was invoked over you in verse 7. They will literally come in and you treat them better than the other people and then they're the one who will take you to your death. That's this. James is being ironical and hysterical in saying, when you do that, you are bearing evil thoughts, and then you are also setting yourself up for tremendous disappointments and judgment. But instead, James invoked the golden rules, which is the second thing. Treat others as you would want to be treated. 
Treat the poor that Jesus pay attention to as you, as you should do so. So means during the gospel we can, we, we can name when Jesus attends to those who do not. Jesus welcomed the children when others and Pharisees and, and disciples saying, shoot them away, get them away from them. They're making too much noise. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Jesus wants the people to heal the women who have nothing in their lives and they bring healing to their lives. When the, when the Canaanite woman came to ask for blessings for the healing of her daughter, when Jesus says, how can I give you the food so that that's prepared for the children? And she rebuked him by saying, even the dogs eat the crumbs off the table. It's a second, hand, second hand, backhand rebuke saying, we all need to give what is left over too, so bless us. And Jesus says, bless are you women of great faith. Example after example of people who do not have the great stations in life, do not have statuses, do not dress well, do not probably don't smell too good. Jesus went to them and attend to them. What about us? What about New Hope Church? What about this community? And I want to get really, really down to practical stuff too. When we have visitors in our midst, do we turn to them and say hello? Sure, maybe we do that. Do we turn to them, not just say hello, but greet them and get to know them better? Better yet, do we really dig deep to get to know each other better? So the two years I've been here, I've been observing, looking, get to know you guys better. But I want to take us to a newer level. Let's get to know each other even more. I know some of you grew up together. Some of you have been to church together. And some of you share the, the, the badge of honor of forming and shaping and charting this congregation together. But how well do you really know one another? You will say, yeah, I'm, I'm content. I know. I'll just pick on Ray. Yeah, I know Ray. He's a good guy. That's, that's good enough. Is that enough? But as fellow disciples, as fellow brothers in Christ, is superficiality enough? Is a mirroring seeing each other once a week on Sunday enough? And in what way, if that's, if not, that's not enough, then in what way can we engage one another's other lives that get to know each other deeper? Do I know, I'm, I'm going to pick on Ray because you're here. Do I know your, your prayer concerns? Well, as a pastor, I do know some, have some ideas, but do I, I, do I actually know them well enough? And that's an even to pick on Ray, but look at one another. Do you know your fellow brothers and sisters' needs, struggles, challenges, thoughts, desire, wishes? Do you know what growing edges of their faith they may have? We can... Go, we can stay as superficial, we can stay as superficiality on the surface, but this is what, all we will ever be until we go deeper. Until we go deeper to ask questions, inquire, out of concern, not out of gossip, not out of uh, curiosity, out of concerns and care. Because we, we, we as human beings, long a desire to be love. The psychologists talk about the basic fundamental of being a human being is the capacity, the capacity and the ability to care for other, being, other people as well as be cared by other people. Hence the golden rules. Treat others as you will want to be treated. We all have our struggles. We all have our joys. Do we share them with one another? In my previous congregation, when we had multiple services and large congregations and many, many home groups, there were two home groups that particularly, no, actually there were three of them that actually were particularly tight together. In fact, one home group, I, sh I think I shared this with some of you guys, about half of the home group basically saying, we're happy the way we are. Six of us, eight of us, don't ever change our membership. We don't want to change. And they stayed together for 20-some-odd years. 
So I show up to say, I'm the new pastor of pastoral care. I design fellowships. I do visits. Uh, I do new members orientations. I also do evangelism and outreach and this and that. They say, great, but don't change us. That's nice. And some church members even told me, we're happy the way we are. We give to the church. We come to church on Christmas and Easter's. Don't come to visit me because I'm not coming to church any more than that. And you kind of look, I'm like, okay. Then what did you ask me to come to be your pastor? Why did you ask me to come to be your pastor, to pastoral care? When you tell me right away, push me away in the arm length. You see, the gesture is pushing away from the start. doesn't allow your heart to be open. But there's two groups that I particularly remember so well. They were new in some ways because, first of all, they are all new members who decided to be a group together, the same class. So t- 10 of them became the, a, a home group together. They retreat twice a year together. They sit together in worship because the, the church is pretty big. And when you go in there, you, don't see, you see people you're like, wow, where is my friend? They sit together. But on fellowship hours, they all venture out to talk to other people. And they meet together on a regular basis. So they do the both things. What I'd like to talk about is the third thing is, the final point is faith in actions. When we reach out to someone, we also have the opportunity to be reached in by someone else. If you extend your arms out as to embrace somebody, no one's going to stand there and look at you like, what is wrong with you? Someone will come and give you a hug, embrace you with great joy and love. When we reach out to someone else by asking them, how is it your day? How is what's happening with your life? What's happening with your spouse? What's happening with your children? What's happening with work? What's happening with your spiritual growth? You know what happened? They in turn ask you the same questions. So reaching out is also reaching in to our faith. James tells us when we show partiality, when we judge We bear evil thoughts. And we are just as condemned as the rule. The two examples you give in the passage, chapter 2, if you look at it, what are the two things you give example of broken laws? Adulteries and murder. Adultery is a brokenness of trust and relationship and fidelity. Murder, well, do I need to say more? Taking someone else's life? What could be more, worse than that? These two things, are, it's what James looked up as an example of broken laws. He is saying partiality, judgment, brokenness. When you divide the body based on superficiality, external things, you are just as condemned. We are, not just you, I am too, if I do that. We are just as condemned as committing adultery and murder because we break the trust, because we break the fidelity of commitment of faith, because we break the commitment that we have for one another to hold each other in prayer and support. So the final point is, faith in action looks like reaching out to be reached in. So I'd like to ask you this. Please take a look around. I know the front of you, the people in the front has turned all the way back. Yes, do a bell face, look around. Just look around. Look who's here. Yeah, okay, I know this is kind of funny. It's okay. I, I think I shared this with you. In the African-American congregation, they move around quite a bit. And this preacher will actually tell people to get up and move around the church. So I won't do that. Some of you like to sit where you sit. You must put your name on the, uh, on the back of the, the, the pew. This is my seat. Don't sit here. So look around. Do you, who do you see? I mean, I'm not asking rhetorical questions. Who do you see? Come on, we got communion, so we got to wrap it up. Come on. Who do you see, really? Wow, okay, you're going to make me wait for this. Okay. How about this? Do you see your friends? Yes. Do you see your family? Yes. And who, you do, who do you not see? 
Have you ever considered who's not here? I think we should. So look around, folks. Look around, reach out, reach in, let your faith grow in actions. Let your faith deepen by doing the things to care for one another. Book of James come to us in a situation the church has to grow or they will die. They have persecutions, real persecution, not just being mocked at, but real life and death persecutions. We don't have that. We've been blessed with this freedom of religions, the freedom of worship. We have the sanctuary we can worship in. We have the greater community here that we can be part of. We're in many ways shelter and love and care for. But also, if we go too far, become content, we will be pamper and get nice and fat and slow in our faith. We need to be, live our faith in actions. Well, literally, our faith will die, will crumble. So Doris went home that night, that day, on Sunday. Her husband asked her when, she, when he picked her up and said, What happened to your shoes, dear? And she said, What shoes? I gained a new friend today. And all I had to do was give away my shoes. And she grinned and grinned and laughed. And she, in truth, she realized she gained more than just a friend because she was about to gain a new vision for her faith. She was about to gain a new community that she can live her faith with, not just for, not just by, but with, together. And she's about to gain a new community of sisters who she will work together with for this new community of believers. And in greater needs than her, than the, those who have greater need than her, she's going to, be able to gain a new vision, a new mission for her life. She gained so much more than that simple pair, by giving away that simple pair of shoes. She reached out, and what she received in return was hundreds, thousands full for her life. Friends, as a community, we cannot stop reaching out. We have to practice here in our community. Look out to those people who you see. Look out to those people who you do not see. Look out to those who people and ask them, engage them, get to know them, not just your home group, but people here. We're too small to do that yet. So reach out to everyone. And our lives, it will be defined by mercy not by judgment, by love, not by partiality, by life, not by death. The golden rules, let your faith live out as you would want your faith to live out as. Let's go forth to reach out and to reach in. Let us pray. In your mercy, O oh God, we submit ourselves to your teaching. We pray, O oh Lord, that these words are again convict our hearts and our lives, that not just in thought that we will, do, will think of something to do, but in actions, in hands, in our feet, in our mouths, in our mindset, our body will be changed and transformed so that we will do what you call us to do. As James urged us to hold fast, hold up our faith, guide us, empower us, embolden us to hold up, hold up our faith. And this we pray in our Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.